Do you remember when you were a little kid, how much fun it was when your parents or maybe an older child or a, a sibling picked you up by the arms and swung you around in a circle so that your feet left the ground? And I'm sure many of us have had the experience of throwing a baby up into the air and catching it and hearing its absolute giggles of delight as it falls back down and gets caught. Well, as we get older and taller, we can't really do those sorts of things anymore. But what we can do is go to amusement parks where we can go on rides like roller coasters and drop towers and all of the other gravity-defying things they have in those locations. And we can have a similar experience, except this time it's often tinged with a little bit of fear as well. So I had never really thought about how these experiences were connected until I began a research project. So I'm an archaeologist, and um, I began studying the archaeology of the human engagement with technology and space movement, space travel. And I started a project on the archaeology of the International Space Station, which is currently orbiting above our heads with its tiny crew of six people. And suddenly, it made me start to think about what gravity was and how it shaped human culture. And it seems like we, we live in gravity every day, but we take it for granted, and we're always trying to escape it. So I want to dig a little bit deeper into what the human cultural engagement with gravity actually is. So on this slide, I have an equation. This is a very famous equation. This is the one devised by Sir Isaac Newton in 1687, and it represents universal gravitation. So this is basically the idea that every object in the universe uh, is attracted to every other object in the universe. And what the equation says, it has F, which is the force of gravity. It has G, the gravitational constant, and we're not even going to go there. M1 and M2 are the masses of two objects. R is the distance between their centres of mass. And that's basically it. That's what gravity looks like. But I'm not showing you this equation because I want you to remember it. I'm showing you this equation because I want you to forget it because I think gravity is far more than just a bunch of symbols and numbers. So one thing gravity is, is work. And there is actually an equation for work too, but I'm not going to bother with that right now. The best way to explain how gravity relates to work is to imagine ascending a very long staircase, a very high staircase. So basically, however fit you are, it, it gets harder work the higher you go because you're, you're performing work against the force of gravity pulling you back. And the, the fact that this is work is demonstrated even further, I think, by the fact that we have invented machines to do this work. So every time you go up in a lift or up in an escalator or watch a forklift or a crane, these are machines we have invented to overcome the force of gravity. And ironically, uh, if you go to the gym, you're not trying to overcome the force of gravity, you're often increasing the amount of gravity uh, by using weights and various other things, uh, to, as if you were doing exercise on the surface of Jupiter or something like that. So, that's kind of a bit practical, but what I think is really interesting about gravity is that it's also about emotions. So, when we were little kids being swung around by our parents, we were excited and exhilarated. People go skydiving and hang gliding and parachuting to get that same thrill, that sense of exhilaration. And also, as you mentioned before, that, that little sense of fear. It's not half as exciting without that little tincture of fear in it. And many of us, or some of us maybe, have, have dreamt of flying. C could I have a show of hands? Uh, uh, how many people here have had a flying dream? I can see a few hands going up. How did it make you feel? Um, put your hand up if it made you feel happy and excited. Uh, there's a few. What if it made you feel sad or scared? I think there's still a couple of hands up. And in fact, you know, it's a well-known phenomenon that, that there are many people who are quite terrified of flying in planes. Not quite the same thing, you're in a, inside another machine. Um, but these two emotions, uh, fear and exhilaration, 
are part of how we experience gravity as well. These are experiences we often have by ourselves, particularly when we're flying in our dreams, inside our own bodies. But gravity also has social implications. And one of my favourite examples of this, it comes from an early Russian rocket science pioneer called Konstantin Tchaikovsky, and he was writing at the last part of the 19th century and earlier part of the 20th century. And he thought gravity held back social process. So he postulated orbiting habitats where people would live a life of luxury without any class distinctions, Everybody would be able to build a palace if they wanted to live in one because there were no transport or construction costs relating to overcoming gravity. Out in Earth orbit, you would have endless sunlight, food would be abundant, you wouldn't need to have feather bedclothes and fancy pillows, you could just sleep wherever you were and feel perfectly warm. So in Konstantin Tchaikovsky's theory, living without gravity would actually create a more equal society. And I still think that is a dream that we should hold on to. But something that maybe is a, a little closer to home. So people might remember that it used to be quite common in children's playgrounds and parks to have uh, model rockets, tall rockets about 30 metres high that little kids could climb up. Do you remember those? There were quite a few in that around Adelaide. And of course, there's many other things in playgrounds as well, swings and slides and jungle gyms and all of that. But in the 60s and 70s, one of the most common sources of injury in children was falling off things at the playground and breaking limbs. And this became such an issue that across many places in the world, including Australia and the US, end of the 70s and the beginnings of the 1980s, a lot of legislation was brought in to make playgrounds safer to redesign these pieces of equipment so that children didn't fall off them so much. So, okay, that's a fairly practical um, measure, I guess. But what's interesting to me about it is uh, the social aspect. So, making those changes are about what society considers are acceptable risks for children, but they're also about uh, a relationship to gravity, a social relationship of gravity, because it's about an idea of what childhood ought to be like, i.e. not full of broken limbs for a start. So this is actually gravity eliciting a social response which is manifested as a material, practical response. Gravity is also gendered. Have you ever thought about bras as a piece of anti-gravity technology? So there is this, and I'm not saying I like this in any way at all, but there is a very sort of common cultural theme which has um, resulted in a lot of really not very nice jokes, which is about gravity being the enemy of women. So we resent gravity. Gravity is not our friend. And this is quite different for blokes who get to have gravitas as they get older, for example. So yes, so we're supposed to hate gravity because it makes our bodies sag, shock horror. And the other way which gravity intersects specifically with women is in pregnancy. So while men get gravitas, women get gravid. They get tethered to Earth by being pregnant and heavy. And in fact, there have been some suggestions that for late-term pregnancy, it might be beneficial to go into space, to go into microgravity, to relieve some of those symptoms. So you can see the social aspects of gravity aren't just about the wholesale structure of society, it's actually also about how people's bodies are perceived and the kinds of even clothing that are made to respond to, to social perceptions of gravity. So we're going to pop up to the International Space Station, where material culture plays, I think, a very interesting role. So when you're orbiting above the Earth, you're effectively in free fall, but we call it microgravity, because, of course, it's not that the Earth, we know this from the equation, it's not that the Earth is not exerting gravitational pull on the International Space Station, it's that 
the speed of travel around the Earth is actually creating a situation of free fall. So it's as if there is no gravity. Everything floats. So on Earth, if we are holding an object and we put it down somewhere, or you could let it go and it will just fall, or we can put it down somewhere, the thing about that is it stays put. It's, it stays where you put it. So you can remember where it is and you can go back and get it. Now, on the International Space Station, it's actually quite different. If you let go of an object, it won't fall, it will stay where it is, and it will begin to float. And because human eyes aren't actually accustomed to focusing in the middle distance, so if you're a crew member on a space station and you just look away for a minute and look back, you often cannot see that object. It's gone. It could still be there, but you can't see it because you, your eyes can't focus on it. And in fact, there are 6,000 lost objects on the International Space Station. <laughs> so what do they do to get around this? They actually use some really simple technology. So there are footholds and handholds throughout the International Space Station. But they also use Velcro, exactly the same as we use it here on Earth. And they use Ziploc bags, exactly the same as the ones that you might have in your kitchen or your car or your garage or something like that. And these are used to pin objects down, to keep them safe in one place. So you'll have something in a Ziploc bag with a piece of Velcro on it and you'll stick it to the wall. They even have Velcro patches on their clothes. So what this means is throughout the International Space Station, there are little patches of gravity. Gravity isn't in the air around them. Gravity is held in these little small bits of Velcro or these Ziploc bags or the footholds or the straps that you see in the picture here. That's uh, Sam Cristoforetti on side, inside the International Space Station. So gravity actually is related to how we remember things. And this means memory in space is a little bit different to how we remember things on Earth. Now, finally, gravity is a dance. So in the 1970s, there was an American choreographer, Steve Paxton, and he decided to create a dance in which gravity was the other partner. And as he said, we swim in gravity from the day we're born. Every cell in your body knows which way is down. And on the basis of this, he created a thing he called the small dance. And I'm going to make you do it now. So all you have to do is, if you're able to stand up, please stand up. And, and stand with your feet just a little bit apart. Thank you. Appreciate everybody participating. So this is like a very cut down short version of what the small dance would be like. So what I want you to do, close your eyes if you feel it's safe to do so. I want you to just nod your head forward a little bit as if you're saying yes, just a little movement. Then just shake it a little bit from side to side like you're saying no. Then I want you to stretch, just the tiniest of stretches, like your whole body, just a little, little stretch. And now just shift your feet gently from your left foot to your right foot, just a little bit. And now sort of breathe into it and feel your spine holding you upright. And all of those muscles in your body, which are supporting your, your spine to keep upright and your organs on the inside, and feel, try and feel gravity through the soles of your feet and how your body is structured in a vertical way to respond to that gravity. So I'll just let you think about that for a moment. And now, open your eyes and sit down in a way that you're comfortable to do. So that was it. That's just a, a very small experience of the idea of the small dance. But I'm going to ask you now to close your eyes again for a little moment. This time I don't want us to feel down to the centre of the earth. I'm going to ask you in your mind to look upwards and imagine the International Space Station just 400 kilometres above our head circling away with its tiny crew and its Velcro patches. Then, 
hundreds of thousands of kilometers away from that, further away from that, we have our old faithful companion, the moon. We'll go past all of the planets of the middle and outer solar system to out beyond the edges of the solar system where the Voyager 1 and 2 deep space probes are winging their way out into the broader galaxy. And all around them, and in between all of the planets and the moon and the Earth, there's cosmic dust, tiny, tiny grains of dust that are left over from the formation of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. And as those grains of dust swirl around the solar system, they fall towards Earth and its gravitational pull. So they're falling down upon us right now. So I want you to open your hand a little and imagine you can feel the grains of cosmic dust falling on your fingers and they're smooth between your fingertips. And if you're like me, thinking about this might give you just a tiny sense of joy that all of this is within your reach without ever leaving Earth. Now, open your eyes again for the final time. So, we're used to this gravity here and now that we experience. But we should be thinking of other gravities as well. We should be thinking of what life might be like as the human body moves into different parts of the solar system. We need to understand the gravity that we exist in right now in order that we can come to understand future gravities that maybe we'll be living in. And of course, as we've seen, gravity is variable all around us at this point in time in, on this part of Earth. Thank you.